So we're happy to have you guys here. We to have an open conversation, and we are live on Facebook. Hi, everybody. Um, wanted to have an opportunity. We're having, this is Best MC's annual event for our members, <coughs> and we education policy leaders around the state to join us for a conversation on a various topic. And every year we have a special guest to share with us some of their lessons learned along the way in education. Um, uh, and we've always been had, had a great um, opportunity for our members and policymakers to have a conversation around the topic. I wanted to make sure everybody knew, I mean, everyone here is aware of who Best NZ is. We are a business leader group who advocates for education as a top priority for the state of North Carolina. We believe North Carolina can have the best education system in the nation. We believe we can and that we should, but we don't now. Our, the history of education in North Carolina is a proud one, and we are committed to that history. We have one of the first, we talked about this, the, the first institutions of, public institutions of higher education, a very early commitment to finance equity, and the first state in the nation that had universal kindergarten, just as a couple of examples. And these are examples of how the state of North Carolina has always looked for innovations that help students. But our best benefit is that we have scaled them up and found ways to scale them statewide, where a lot of across the state you find these little pockets of innovation and they don't go any further. North Carolina has a proud history of taking those innovations and really scaling them up. And that's really how Best NC operates. The business leaders of, of the state want to commit to these opportunities. And so when I say we're not where we need to be, as a state, we are pretty average in the country. Um, and the country is really below average if you look around the nation, and that's not good enough. Um, we have a lot of students, the highest graduation rates we've had in the history of North Carolina, and yet about half of our students aren't meeting any of the benchmarks for career and college readiness. Another measure that we look to is we just had the PISA, the international PISA exams, and we found that North Carolina, like the rest of the country, out of the 35 comparable OECD countries, only four are worse than North Carolina. That means 30 are better. So we have a long way to go, and we do believe that North Carolina can get there. Um, and we know that the key to student achievement, other than the family and the home that they come from, is the educator. And so our focus has really been on how do we transform education in North Carolina, looking at the educators. I'll take math as the example. A couple of years here in North Carolina, we implemented some of the highest math standards in the world. They're on par with Singapore, which is the highest performing in the country in the world. But only about half of our high school, <coughs> senior high school students are being taught by a licensed math teacher. So we have a pipeline problem. If we don't have highly qualified math teachers in front of every single student, we will not breach that challenge when only 50% of our students are achieving on any of the benchmarks. This is an educator pipeline issue, and we really believe that improving student achievement is all about elevating educators. So, to their credit, over the last couple of years, um, in a bipartisan effort, we've seen increases in teacher pay. Um, for the last three years, after really having no teacher pay adjustments from 2009 to 2013, we're seeing teacher pay increases coming in the next two years to the base schedule, and we're really optimistic about that. But that doesn't change the experience of the teacher. We still need to pay teachers more, and we need to continue on this path. But we also need to think about the experience that the teacher is getting when they come into the school place. And so this comes to the conversation we're gonna to have tonight, which is when you walk into the school as a new teacher, and you don't have a career opportunity, other than leaving your classroom, it hurts the students at every level. You have teachers who are coming into the profession and they don't have a resource for improving their craft. They don't have a pathway to become a master teacher other than, again, leaving the classroom. And then the principal gets spread thin because you don't have opportunities for teachers within the schoolhouse building. And so how do you really think differently, not just about teacher pay, but really how teachers' experiences in the schoolhouse building? And so this is what SNC has been advocating now for, for a couple of years. And we invited Michelle Reed and George Parker today to help us understand what they did. Um, they're, two, no, they're no two less likely friends. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. <laughs> and, and I think what we hope 
to hear from you is just a little bit about how on earth you're here today and you're both really laser focused on elevating educators as we are. You come from different sides of the aisle, so to speak, um, different, um, different perspectives and how you made that come together personally and also the role of the teachers in that conversation. Because one thing we do say all the time is it's not a one size fits all strategy. Um, these are big cultural changes. We have teachers who are used to do things the same way. So I want to hear a little bit about that. Um, and so um, I'm going to skip the introductions, but I will say if anybody wants to go to um, best-nc.org slash 2017LG, that's our legislative gathering page, you can find all the information you want about our guests. Um, that gives us more time to have a conversation. So I'm going to ask just really quickly in your words, Michelle, um, we're, the program we're talking about is called LIFT and the impact in, in Washington, D.C. Can you just give us a quick overview of what that program is um, so we have an understanding of how sure. it um, so first, let me give a little bit of context around why we um, why we put uh, this system and this program in place. Um, when I took over the DC Public Schools in June of 2007, um, we were largely considered the um, most dysfunctional and lowest performing school district in the country. Um, we were the only school district uh, in the country that was on high risk status with the US Department of Education. Um, we were spending, depending on who you asked, different amounts, but about $18,000 per child per year. So it was, if not the highest, amongst the highest um, uh, in terms of per pupil expenditures of urban districts across the country. And yet, um, on the NAEP TUDA uh, exam, um, we were at the absolute bottom in terms of urban uh, public school districts. 8% of our eighth graders were operating um, at grade level in mathematics, 8%, which means that 92% of our kids were failing. Um, and yet, if you were to have looked at the performance evaluations of the adults in the system, you would have found exactly the opposite. The vast majority, 99% of, uh, of our educators were rated as doing uh, just a great job. Um, and you could not look at those statistics and say, look, well, where is the disconnect here? You can't have um, a, a system that is just continually failing kids, and yet we're saying to all the adults, you're doing just fine. Um, at, in addition to that, um, as we talked to the educators and the teachers in the system, what they were saying was that they didn't think the performance evaluation was very good. They weren't particularly happy with it. They didn't think that it was an accurate reflection of their performance. Um, they did not feel at all that um, it helped them professionally develop themselves. So it was pretty sort of widespread knowledge that we needed to do something about the teacher evaluation system. Um, at the same time, uh, George um, came in and he knew we were about to enter into a contract negotiation. Um, the contract uh, had sort of been expired for some time, uh, and he said to me, "I." I know that you're going to try to, you know, put all kinds of new things into the contract. He said, I just want you to know, at the end of the day, we are the lowest paid teachers in the region, DC public school teachers are. Um, and that needs to change because the, the challenge that our teachers have is, is the greatest amongst the region. Um, so uh, through a really long negotiation process, um, we got to a place where, um, where we put together a teacher performance evaluation system and a compensation system that matched that, uh, that uh, we think did a very good job of balancing um, the difficult interests, um, making sure that the teacher evaluations were based largely on growth in academic achievement levels of kids, but doing that in a way that was both fair to teachers and very transparent, very clear, so that they understood exactly how they were going to be measured, what they could expect, both in the immediate term and in the longer term, if they were an effective teacher. Um, and so, like I said, it was it a was long battle. We, uh, we, we duped it out of many a night. Um, uh, and I think probably the most important 
piece to this um, would probably be that uh, through it all, even though we didn't agree on a whole lot, um, we were having a conversation uh, at lunch today about civil discourse. And I think that we always had a certain level of respect for one another, um, though we didn't always agree on kind of the specific methods. We both knew that um, e the other person wanted the best for our kids. Um, and it was, I think, important to always keep that in mind. Um, the evaluation system, though, is relatively straightforward. Um, so uh, impact uh, basically says that 50% um, of the evaluation will be based on um, student achievement gains, based on now a number of different measures. Um, and then the other 50% based on things like observations of classroom practice um, and contributions to school community. Um, so we put impact in place first, and in the subsequent years, DCPS, this was actually after we both left, um, put in a program called DC Lift, which is a program that is specifically geared towards how do you um, incent the best teachers to want to stay in the system um, by giving them you know, clear security, um, incenting them to teach um, in uh, where they're needed the most, in high poverty schools and in low performing schools. Um, but also giving them uh, in, uh, opportunities for increased responsibility without necessarily having to leave the classroom. And, and those are all things that we have heard um, throughout our time working together from teachers that they really wanted, they, they, they wanted to know, yes, if I'm an effective teacher, that's great, I get a lot um, from that, but I also you know, want to be able to do more, not necessarily want to go on the track to becoming an administrator, but how can I have more of an impact <coughs> outside of my classroom? And that's, that's a lot of what Lyft is trying to do. That's and different. Yes. So you had to negotiate a major contract with the new chancellor. And you, and this was a big, this was a big change, right? You changed the teacher evaluation, you changed the compensation models, you lifted the pay, all at the same time, and yet you had what was it a 70% union, 80% union vote? Mm -hmm. and, and the rest of us are, I don't know, looking at Time Magazine, and that there's no way these two people can be getting along. How, how, do you, how do you secure an 80% vote with something this new and different? Well, change is always difficult. That's the first thing. So the change within me was difficult too. Uh, when Michelle first came, we, we had some battles. Uh, without a doubt, we had some battles. Um, but I think um, two things occurred. One is that um, we talked to each other, not at each other. That was very important because we always kept a certain level of respect in our conversations. I don't think that occurs enough today um, between those who advocate for certain uh, reform issues and those who do not, that we have a tendency to talk at each other instead of to each other. So I think even though we had disagreements on issues, uh, we were also capable of knowing what we agreed on and we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Those things that we could agree on, we agreed on. And one of the things that we did agree on, which I think was the most important, and that is this is about educating the children in the District of Columbia. I think neither of us was proud of where we were ranking among other uh, uh, states and other districts in terms of student performance. So ultimately, uh, it did neither one of us any good to fight all the time without finding some resolution about improving kids' uh, performances. So I think that we start with that. Of course, coming from a union perspective, it's how do you balance that with your role as a union leader and a labor leader in terms of protecting teachers and at the same time uh, uh, crafting something that also puts children uh, first. And so it took a while. It took a while. But I think that some of the innovative things that we came up with uh, ultimately are paying some results in terms of how DC kids are, are, are moving forward now. I think the performance pace, uh, performance, could linking performance to teacher, uh, linking com uh, um, compensation to teacher performance, I think that was a very uh, tough thing to do because there's a lot of pushback on that. 
And so the difficulty in doing it is you got to make it fair. You have to get people to buy into it. I think one of the things that we did, and, and, and I give Michelle a lot of credit for this, is that she heard me when I said DC teachers were the lowest paid in the area. And so with the compensation system that we put in, pay, in place, DC teachers went from bottom to top. So that was, that was a great incentive. I, I, don't, I don't get people who say money doesn't matter. It does. When, when you got house notes to pay and children to feed, money does matter. So we started out with a very strong base for all teachers. And then we moved into a for pay for performance system. And that's a very difficult thing to do. So it has to be fair. It has to be something everybody understands. And it has to be achievable. And I think that we accomplished that. But overall, I think uh, finding that, that process by which people talk to each other, even when you disagree, to reach a common goal that's to the benefit of students, I think that we finally reached that point that, uh, in our negotiations. It was tough, and, and working, education is a tough business right now to get something that really works for children, but I think the ability to continue talking until we could find something that was mutually agreeable that we felt, uh, as we called our contract, something that was good for kids and fair to teachers. I think that we, we accomplished that. Yeah. And I'd say both, both goals were accomplished. So over the last you know, 10 years, DC public schools has become um, one of the fastest growing uh, in terms of academic achievement and results of school districts in the country. And so the academic progress is there, um, but we've also moved from the bottom to the top in terms of teacher pay. So whereas teacher pay used to top out for DC teachers at about $87,000, um, this year it'll be $144,000. So for a lot of teachers, we've actually doubled their pay. So um, if you're a high performing teacher and a high value school and you have a staff subject, you're going to be right up there in the six figure range. Is that? I mean, I'd say well into that. And, and I think that. If you're a you know, beginning teacher, you know that um, you know, in three years I could be making $144,000. That, that is, um, I think, an, a, an incentive. And to George's point, teachers don't go into teaching for the money, um, but to say that the money doesn't matter, that isn't really accurate either. It, it is a reflection of how we value and respect teachers in the teaching profession, and I think it does go a long way. I think that's key, that teachers are professionals. And just as doctors, lawyers, and other professionals are well paid, I think we got to begin to look at our teachers to say, hey, hold teachers accountable. I, I believe that your role is to, is, is, is to teach children. But we got to get away from teachers being a volunteer organization, a volunteer organization. That if you teach school, it's that second thing you do, but it's not a real profession. It's, it's, more important of caring and, and sacrifice and uh, humanity. No, the money helps and the money counts. And if you're a professional, you want to be paid as a professional. Uh, but hold folks accountable. And, and I, I, I'm one who believes that you got to empower teachers because they're, they're on the ground. They're driving the car and building a Rolls Royce and nobody to drive it. It just sits there. But you got to hold teachers accountable. But as, as, in addition to giving teachers accountability and responsibility, you got to give them some authority to do some things. Uh, and so I think that we kind of reached a, a happy medium there uh, in terms of doing that. Well, I have just one follow-up question, and then I'll open it up to, to questions. Um, when you say we, right, the two of you were obviously at the table, but I understand teachers were really involved at, you know, classroom teachers were involved in design. How did that happen, and, and how important was that? Yeah. Um, teachers were a huge part of designing the new evaluation and, and compensation system. Um, we brought teachers in um, uh, voluntarily uh, to working sessions to and, and focus groups to talk about this. So we first asked them what is not working about the current um, performance evaluation system? What would you like to see uh, in one? We, you know, when we put this in place in 2009, I don't think there was another school district in the country that was using student achievement growth as part of the teacher evaluation system. And we said to teachers, okay, you know, can we do this, does it make sense? And the feedback that we got, I think was incredibly valuable to the design of that process. I'll just give you a couple of examples. 
teachers overwhelmingly said to us, yes, student achievement should, should count. Um, but they said, one, it should be based on growth um, instead of just sort of the straight proficiency rates, which made a whole lot of sense, especially in a, in a district like DC. Um, secondly, they, they, they gave us some nuances that I think, if you're a policymaker, you don't really think about. So for example, they said, um, we have to think about things like attendance. So for example, if a kid is coming into our classroom in March, and they take the test in April, that kid should not count towards our value add, which is absolutely correct. Or they said, or the kids who are chronically absent, right? If you miss more than a certain number of days, like how can I be accountable for your growth? So we actually built policies into the evaluation system that were based on the things that teachers were most concerned about in terms of the fairness, right? If I'm gonna, if you're gonna judge me by the achievement of my, my students, which we understand, then you have to make sure it's fair. Um, and so we, we made our best effort to make sure that all of those concerns were addressed in the model. And that doesn't mean that the first iteration of impact was, was exactly right. Since then, I think, and this is one of the things that DCPS should be um, uh, really um, congratulated for, is that they have iterated that model several times since we put the first one in place based on ongoing teacher feedback about what was working and what was not working. Um, and so I, I think that, that having the teacher voices at the table in the design of any um, evaluation and compensation system is absolutely great. And as Michelle said, the constant monitoring, I think one of the good things, again, I agree that, this, that DCPS did is uh, it looked at what teacher's feedback was and, and said, okay, uh, we need to change the percentage in a different manner because it started out at 50%, I think it's now 35 So I think constant monitoring, and, and don't be afraid to get it wrong the first time. I mean, it, 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 you, you, get, you improve on the product. And so anytime you're doing something as dramatic as was done in DC, uh, it's gonna be the first <laughs> iteration of it and, and that you have to be constantly monitoring and improving on it. But I think it has shown that student, improve, uh, student um, achievement is improving in DC. So there were some things that, were, that was done that was correct. And this is the funny thing across the country, what you'll hear from folks is, well, we don't know exactly what's going to work, right? So when, when people sort of introduce new ideas, this, well, how do we know that's gonna work? Well, we already know what's not working, right? The current evaluation system 90% of the teachers do not think it is any good. So we know that does not work. So even though we don't have a 100% assurance that the new system is gonna be perfect, um, you know, you, you have to be willing to sort of take things on and be, and as, as long as the district, I think, has an openness and a willingness to, to continue to modify and make it better, um, I think everybody has to take the chance on doing something different because you know the current system isn't working for anyone. Um, do have any? Yeah. yeah, you mentioned, um, or at least originally, that 50% of the um, evaluation system was based on contribution to school community. No, or to so 50% was based is based on um, achie student achievement growth. Mm -hmm. um, then that that used to all be based on just on one uh, task, which was the state examination, and now it's split. So 35% is based on that state test, but 15% are based on other standardized measures of student growth. The other 50% is based on both observations of classroom practice, um, which is an important piece to it of, of really understanding um, you know, what the daily practices of teachers is and, and things <coughs> like contributions to school community. Right, so could you expand on what exactly that means? Is it you know, things like the school culture and yes, work? Okay. Absolutely, I mean, we had teachers you know, who were, as an example, they were uh, coaching the soccer team and taking kids to college trips on the weekends and you know, going above and beyond the call of duty. And we felt that those um, types of actions needed to be taken into consideration also because they were helping to build a, a, a set of cultures and expectations for the students that were leading to the better outcomes. Um, and so I think our, our biggest point was that it, it is impossible to evaluate a teacher's performance through one single lens. 
Um, you, you, you have to look at it in a multifaceted way. There are so many things that add to um, the effectiveness of a teacher, and what we were trying to do is, is lay out as, as many of those facets as we could. Um, and I think that, again, I, I think at the end of the day, while, while the first generation wasn't perfect, it sort of set the framework for some modifications now, and I'd say that the um, vast majority of the teachers in DC uh, right now would say that this is a much more accurate reflection of their impact in the classroom. And the context matters. I think the fact that you, you talked with the teachers in your community for what mattered to them. There were 40,000 students, right, in the, in the Washington, D.C. schools. Is that right um, When we took over the system, it was a little bit more than that, yeah. And so smaller than our larger metropolitan areas. And so it was a district. And one thing Best NC has advocated for is that it shouldn't be one size fits all. That the educators in the community need to be engaged in defining from the, well, all of it, frankly. So. Um. When you talk about accountability and educator accountability, certainly uh, testing is a key component of that. Um, and through the accountability movement of late, we've seen an evolution of thinking about this to where some people believe that in some situations, students are being over-tested. Mm -hmm. How do you balance the idea of over-testing versus uh, ensuring accountability? Yeah, I think this is an, an incredibly important thing that we probably don't talk about enough um, in uh, school reform. Um, I, I do believe that there, um, in some districts and in some schools, there is an over, now an overemphasis on testing. Um, and as a parent, I can tell you that I, I saw this firsthand, right? So when my daughter was in elementary school, she came home one day in late April and she said, um, we watched movies today and next week we're not doing any work either. I was like, wait, what's going on? And she said, because the test is over, mommy. <laughs> and I thought, what, like, what, are we, what, are, what are we communicating to our kids if school for the last two months you know, isn't really focused on learning because the test is over? And so I do think that that is a, a trap that we cannot fall into. Um, I think that we have to also understand that um, folks who have an overemphasis on, on sort of the drill and kill, the, I mean, the research actually shows uh, that teachers who are teaching specifically to the test and that, that they, their students don't do better and it's the schools that like, embrace a broad-based curriculum um, and teach higher thinking skills that those kids actually do better academically. So if people really want their kids to do well on tests, then the answer is not to, 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 to overemphasize it. Um, but, but it's a short-term thing, right? It's like, oh gosh, we're going to be evaluated both as an individual and as a school on these tests, and so this is what we need to focus on. Um, so that's a conversation I think that, that has to be had because I think it is frustrating to parents. Um, I think it's frustrating to teachers and administrators. Um, and, uh, and so there's, like in everything in education, you have oftentimes like two camps on these extreme sides and the answer is more in the middle. Yes, you have to have accountability. Yes, you have to have a standardized way of measuring student achievement. Um, but it has to be balanced um, with things that we know work. Has there been any other school district that tied teacher pay or teacher increases to, um, in some part, uh, student growth on tests? Um, in here, in North Carolina, we had an evaluation system, not even tied to teacher pay, but just evaluations, and a much smaller part than 50% that got thrown out because of, um, you know, pushback from teachers. Uh, and the teachers said they felt they were being judged and oppressed. So has any other school district done this? Yeah, so after we put impact in place, um, when Race to the Top uh, was occurring um, under the Obama and Duncan administration, actually 38 states across the country passed um, some kind of state law that tied teacher evaluations to increases in student performance. Right, and North Carolina was one of those, but it didn't. Right, but, but, the, but the question is then how was it implemented, right? And, and, and you have a, a wide <coughs> variety of implementation of those systems. Um, I think in some school, in some individual school districts and states across the country, they did do that. They implemented it well. Those things have gone well. And in others, 
Um, you know, they did it so that they could get some rates to the top funds, and then they sort of abandoned it in implementation. Um, one thing that I'll say on that is this, is that even though the vast majority of our teachers, when we were changing the evaluation system, said that the current evaluation system wasn't good, when we introduced this new one, there was still a tremendous amount of consternation and pushback. And it was because even though I know what is currently utilized is not good, at least I know it. It's comfortable, right? I know what to expect. I know how it works. And when you're talking about doing something different, that is the unknown. And generally, educators tend to be a little risk averse, right? So they, that was scary. Um, it is absolutely necessary to push through the hard part, right? That, that initial pushback. Um, now, this is nine years, uh, actually, um, yeah, into, into this initiative, but probably we're on year um, seven of the implementation of the um, evaluation system. If you were to change that system now, you would have a full-scale revolt on your hands. Um, the teachers really, really like this system now. They feel like it is incredibly clear, that it's transparent, that it does reward um, the, the, the most effective teachers. So had we abandoned SHIP after the pushback that we got in the first 18 months, you know, nothing would have changed. Um, sometimes you have to be able to push through that initial pushback and opposition that you're going to get. Um, and people have to be able to see, oh wait, the sky didn't fall, all the bad things that people said were gonna happen, none of that happened, and I'm getting you know, recognized and rewarded and being valued for the work that I'm doing. And there's a constructive feedback loop too, yes. right? This isn't just a one-time kind of audit, but can you talk about a little bit about how this is part of their professional development of the teacher, not just about pay? Yeah. I, I think several things are important, and, and, and I, I, I kind of get the gist of your question here. Um, about what happened here in Carolina. One of, the, one of the very important components of this is trust and fairness. Teachers have to feel that if you are linking what they consider their job, because once you start linking student performance to teacher evaluation, teachers view this as a threat to their job. And so it's so critically important that number one, they have trust that they are going to be evaluated fairly, that the instrument itself is a fair instrument. And when you're saying when you start linking compensation to it, is that um, if you start out with a low level of trust, you're going to have to work on that trust regardless of what this instrument is that you're bringing in. Because uh, one, the pushback that we got very often was uh, pushback in terms of, well, how do we know that this is going to be implemented with fidelity. And, you know, because anytime you're dealing with human beings, we're not perfect, all right? But working on trust is so important when you start a, a tying uh, teacher job security to student performance and et cetera, and the same with compensation. I don't think teachers in general, though, are opposed to being held accountable. They just want to be held accountable fairly. And, and, and given the authority to do what is necessary to increase student achievement. Now, the, the other part of your question I couldn't quite get because no. I went off on some what was it? <laughs> the, uh, the, the professional feedback loop, right? This is, this is not it's, Well, okay. it's very important. <laughs> and, 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 and one of the things you have to do also anytime you are, in, in addition to the fairness, teachers are looking for support, all right? You are implementing a new process. So uh, professional development is, is key uh, so that teachers and the evaluators, whether it's the principal or outside evaluators, clearly understand how to implement the system fairly. And, and, and that's critically important, is making sure teachers understand uh, how to work the system, how, how, how to achieve with the system, how to use this new evaluation system correctly, make sure that it's implemented fairly and effectively, and, and you'll be okay with it. It'll be okay. But there's going to be pushback against change. It comes. It comes. It comes. We have time for one more question. 
Um, I have one that I feel like we probably have to ask today. The, uh, obviously, there are a lot of public education advocates who are very concerned today about the confirmation of Betsy DeVos as education secretary, fair or unfair. But I'm curious to hear what y'all's take on it is. Interesting. The, the take on the uh, Ms. DeVos's confirmation as education secretary. Well, I mean, I think anyone who saw the hearings were not impressed with the performance on the hearings. Um, it is what it is. We have the final word to work through it. Uh, the vast majority of education is happening at the state level. So for Best MC, if you want Best MC's take on it, we will continue to do the work we're doing. Um, we don't anticipate any significant changes that are going to affect the ability of the state to empower their educators and pay teachers more. So it's, it doesn't affect our advocacy. I, I think one thing, and I can talk about my own self-growth on this whole issue because uh, at one time I was simply a traditional public school advocate. That's it. Don't bring charters, don't bring vouchers, don't bring anything but traditional public school. I have grown to the point of understanding that in order to get our children where they need to get, as, as I have traveled this country and I've looked at a lot of communities, especially poor communities, and to see the quality of education that our children are receiving, I feel there's an urgency to get it done now by any means necessary. We're in such a situation that we cannot at this point eliminate anything that can work because our kids get 12 years pretty much free to get it done. And I think while we're working, and I think public education, traditional public schools will always be dominant. But I think at the point that we come to the realization that there are many public schools, uh, traditional public schools, who need, that need work, need to be reformed, need to become effective. And in the meantime, what do we do? And I think we have to open our doors to other means, charters and et cetera, uh, in order to make sure our children get educated. And I, I'm of the mindset at this point that we need to educate kids by any means necessary because for many kids like myself who grew up poor, right here in North Carolina, education is it. That's the only avenue you have for progressing. And if we don't get that right as the adults, we are stifling the life of many children. And until we get in a public education system that is working on all eight cylinders, if you have an eight cylinder car, we got to use all of the ancillary uh, components that we can, whether it's charters or whatever, to get our children an education. We can't afford to wait. So in the meantime, we work on the whole educator pipeline for every student in the system. We have to work on systemic change. We absolutely have to. That's the long game. Ms. Rue, you talked to Donald Trump about taking that uh, education cabinet job. Is that right? I did. Okay. What's your reaction to Ms. DeVos' confirmation? You know, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's to your point. Some people think this is the greatest thing ever. Some people, you know, thought that this is going to be the downfall of public education. I think at the end of the day, for me, um, she has been confirmed. I think that I've known Betsy for a long time. She's a very smart, she's a reasonable person. I think it is going to be important for her to do a lot of outreach to educators and others to hear what the concerns are so that she can start to allay those. And then I think as, as a, a community of educators, it's our responsibility to, to um, you know, both, uh, you know, do what we can to make sure that she is successful and that she um, does uh, have a focus on serving all kids um, and that we also have good accountability um, measures in place that, that, that we can, you know, uh, ensure that the things that she is pushing um, are successful. And I think that she um, will be receptive to that. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for your time. I appreciate it and um, look forward to continuing the conversation with our members later this evening. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.